much. Welcome, everyone. Hi. Hello. Hello. I'm Dr. Hunter Peterson, and this is Open Forum. So um, I'd like to start class by just finding out how many are new to Open Forum. Any hands? Okay. Great. So, Open Forum is a, a dialogue that we do once a month uh, here at Pilgrims in the Education Center, first Wednesday of every month from 6.30 to 8. And this uh, conversation is an opportunity to bring any and all health questions you have uh, to the discussion, and we will talk about them. Um, as you see, I haven't, you know, kind of prepared a PowerPoint or a formal lecture, so it's very much, I feel like, a conversation. So raise your hand, interrupt me, let's kind of take the conversation where we want it to go. Um, I did come today to prepare to talk about uh, detoxification and fasting. And so I have kind of a set of principles to talk about, and we will start there. Um, and of course, all of this is being recorded, so I started the camera. So it will be on our website if you want to take a peek at we talked about share with a friend and um, this is a little bit of a unique lecture in that we're actually going to be talking about a concept detoxification medicine very near and dear to my heart that also is a prelude to the upcoming group juice detox that we will be um, hosting here in this education center starting next Thursday so I'm sure some of you are interested to learn what that's all about, and we are going to talk about that in detail probably towards the end of the conversation, and um, we'll make sure to leave space for questions and also opportunities to register in those uh, last remaining spots we have. So, um, I, a little bit of background for me, I'm a naturopathic physician, and I am the clinic director of Coeur d'Alene Healing Arts, so we are just right downtown off uh, 5th and Coeur d'Alene. And um, the clinic's been there for a little over 30 years, my predecessor before me, and now me for the last five years. So, um, again, if you don't know much about our clinic, we have a great website. The videos will be there, a lot of information. So feel free to kind of visit it and look around. Um, What's the web address? It's uh, cdahealingarts.com. Perfect. Yeah, and I have information about the clinic in the back. And um, if any of you want to be kind of on our listserv, uh, just to learn about kind of what we got going on, different lectures, different events, um, group programs, then we do send out some really great info. So feel free to get on our listserv. Um, so to start, I want to create a space for getting some questions up on the board that we'll circle back around to at the end of the discussion. So um, any and everything, it doesn't have to be related to the topic I'm presenting today. Uh, what questions are there out there that uh, you'd like to hear about? Yes? Well, one of my questions is um, that your detox program is two weeks, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes, often, I only have a few days. So I'm hoping that you can cover a shorter fast and some different benefits to different ones, because I think you're covering that anyway. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand outward a little beyond the program that we'll be doing. I'll just be giving the broad outline, but I can talk about, you know, different methods for sure. And Great. A lot of my patients, I would give an abbreviated version even of the detox that we will be doing as a group, so Great. that could be an option too. Good. Yeah. What other questions are there out there? Yes? I have already signed up for the detox awesome. program, and I was trying to encourage my husband to sign up. Yeah. But he's diabetic, just, you know, mild diabetic. He takes 500 milligrams of metformin a day. Okay. And, um, yeah. I just wondered if it's a choice. He's always afraid, you know, to not eat because he's diabetic. Right. Blood sugars yeah. and all that. Yeah, I've, I've uh, very successfully navigated many, many diabetic patients through the protocol. And um, I say successfully because what we often find is they kind of need to go off their medications during because their okay. blood sugar numbers stabilize so well. But we definitely do modifications and adjustments for individual chronic diseases, and that would be one that we would want to make sure to give specific guidance around. But totally safe and effective, too. Yeah. 
Other questions about any and everything? Okay. So yes. she asked about the detox, do, sure. or doing it shorter. What about the, um, I see, you said detox and fasting. Yeah. I've heard so much about fasting. Um, it's not a road I'm going down yet. Yeah. And I wonder how you can do it if, for instance, if I don't eat like three, four hours into the morning, I, I feel nauseous, I feel like I'm going to pass out. Yeah. I need food, so how do you fast? Uh -huh. <laughs> and we'll talk more about it. The, the program that we'll be doing as a group is not um, a water fast. So there will be calories being consumed throughout the day, but the fast is a uh, physiological fast in the sense that the process of, di process of digestion will be um, paused during that while we get passive nutrition, basically. And would that be good for some of the leaky gut type issues? Certainly, yeah. That would yeah. be a condition I very much see this beneficial to. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Any questions? Um, just broadly to get up on the board for... Uh, any health related questions? Yeah. Can you detox from excessive amount of exposure to um, like uh, cell phone towers? <laughs> yeah, from electromagnetics. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think the best way to detox from them is to remove yourself from. The environment. <laughs> yeah, right. I know it's tricky. Um, yeah, you know that's a really emerging science. Um, I my best uh, detox is prevention around issues like that with EMFs. I don't think we have really powerful ways to, um, you know, kind of remove uh, existing damage from those processes beyond doing really good tissue repair and cellular repair. And from that standpoint, detoxing and the ways we're going to talk about it are really as good of a method as anything I can imagine because um, fasting is probably the most powerful way to elicit the most efficient um, repair at the cellular level. And so, in a sense, I, I think it would be one of the perfect modalities for that issue. Yeah. Yes? I don't know if this is even related, but um, yeah. fasting, does that, I know it, it helps our whole body, does it help our lungs? I'm thinking of all the stuff that we've had all uh -huh. summer, yeah. and yeah. the kind of damage it's doing to our lungs. Absolutely, I mean, I, I think, again, the broad principle that I'll discuss more will speak directly to that process of cellular repair, but it's important to re realize that the lungs are a major um, eliminatory organ, too. And so when we're mobilizing toxins, you know, we actually focus a lot on breath work and expanding um, exchange in the lung tree to really help that tissue specifically um, be <coughs> detoxified and, and repaired. So, yeah. So I have a question. Yeah. Um, so we'll be more just for this open forum. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> So I've never asked you about like old dental fillings and stuff yeah. and how important maybe that might be to have them removed or mm -hmm. Yeah. I can chat about that um amalgam removal. Yes. Okay. Like yeah. if that's something you think is important or Yeah, let me let me touch on that when okay. we circle back around at the end. Absolutely. Any others? Pam, do you have any questions? <laughs> I forgot them all. Can I uh, ask you again? <laughs> okay, sure. Yes. Would you take the moment to discuss the uh, vaccine debate? Okay. Uh, well, not only flu vaccination, but... Oh, that's yeah, flu that's, vaccination. that's a big one to chew off. I mean, that, that's like a whole open forum in itself, but um, I can kind of give a, a, a primer on it, I'll say. Um, yeah. And you said not just flu vaccination. Yeah, well, mostly like hear you speak about... For me personally, I don't have yeah. small children anymore, yeah. but um, okay. flu vaccines always okay. a big battle in our house. Yeah. Can you include in that herd immunity? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can mention the concept of herd immunity um, in terms of how that relates to the um, different camps of vaccine immunization. Sure. Yeah. Just one. Yes. Um, could you say a little bit about how, I mean, it would be a general herbs, but passion flower, how it um, interacts with the whole system, kind of? I mean, I know part about its uses, but... Um, Specifically passion flower? 
Well, passion flower, but also how the herbal, how that world, um, I, I don't know how to say what it is that I'm looking for. Um, just a little bit about the, the, the physical interaction. You know, how, how it's utilized. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say Materia Medica. That's just a... And I don't mean in homeopathic form. I mean Absolutely, in yeah. The, yeah, the tincture. Uh, yeah, the botanical extract. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Happy to. Yeah. Any others? Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about hives and how, well, like why some people are more prone to hives for <laughs> so, um, all right, predisposition, causation, and treatment. Sure. Yeah, back. Um, do you know much about GI mapping? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess the question is, is it necessary to address certain ailments, or should you have that done first? Is it just kind of an eye-opener? Yeah, uh -huh. sure. Are you speaking to any of the specific companies or just the concept of it in general? Um, the concept in general, okay. but... Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can talk to that. Or at least my perspective. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Any special considerations in detox for a dialysis patients? Um, there would be, yes. Uh, specifically fluid intake. Um, would have to be really closely monitored. It would depend on, you know, the degree of kidney functionality. So if that's somebody who's potentially considering doing it, um, and there's, you know, some detail about the health background, I'd, I'd actually love to chat about it and whether or not it's appropriate based on it individually before kind of deciding. So I, I can hang around after for sure to chat about that. Yeah? Is there a detoxing that can improve eyesight? Hmm. One of the things I observe when fasting protocols happen is how people's eyesight improves. That's not necessarily a lasting change that's always observed, but from the same theory of how fasting and detoxing scavenges free radical and oxidative damaging species, which probably are one of the main culprits in diminished vision, then I, I would say that yes, I think absolutely it has that potential. I wouldn't necessarily say that a one, two week detox would take a, you know, dramatically nearsighted individual and somehow make them have 20-20 vision, but especially things like macular degeneration and cataracts, um, very probably responsive to therapeutics like detox and fasting. Okay. Anything else before we jump in? Okay, so um, I actually wanted to ask one more question, everybody. Um, just to get a sense for the audience, um, were there any individuals who were really keen on wanting to mostly focus on more of the nuances of all of the different methodologies of fasting versus really appreciating the detox more generally? Um, is anybody really wanting to kind of hone in on that part? Well, I was interested in the different fasting and okay. then also how we, um, there was something else that was mentioned. Um, yeah, intermittent, calorie restriction yeah, intermittent or, fasting, or, calorie restriction, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'm going to touch on all those, I just I want to yeah. make sure that it seems like our audience very much wants to learn about detoxification in the program, mm -hmm. and so I'll spend a major or majority of our time in that focus, but I'm going to touch on some of these other methodologies and go into a little more detail just to broaden the conversation a bit, so sounds good. Um, so. I mean, I guess if we're talking about detoxification medicine, um, it's important to break down that word a little bit and, you know, use the root of that, which is, what is a toxin? So, any substance that irritates or creates harmful effects in the body that stresses our function of organ or cellular tissue is a toxin. So, that's a very broad definition. Um, basically, anybody, anything that causes harm at the cellular level, I would consider a toxin. Um, a lot of sources of them, right? We have 
external sources and we have internal sources. So from an external sourcing standpoint, three primary method, methods of exposure. We have physical contact, you know, so through the skin touching. We have inhalation, breathing toxins in. Someone mentioned smoke, it's a good example. Um, but fumes and all of the things in our industrialized world that off-gas um, are examples of, of uh, inhaled toxins. And then probably biggest from an external source standpoint is ingestion. So actually um, moving through our intestinal tract and absorbing through the intestinal mucosa. Um, so uh, a few examples of some of these ingestion type of toxins. We have pesticides and herbicides. We have food additives, heavy metals. Um, I consider medications, prescription medications, actually toxins. Our body has to detoxify them. Carcinogens, and not just carcinogens from products that are you know, contaminated, but we actually create carcinogens. For example, um, when we char things on the barbecue, we're creating carcinogens, right? All that stuff is basically cancerous causing compounds. Um, free radicals of various types. Um, interestingly, when we talk about um, inhaled sources of toxicity, one of the biggest forces of that is actually consuming foods that we have a toxic reaction to once it enters the bloodstream. Um, and that would honestly be one of probably the most prominent sources of toxicity in the body. I mean, could we all argue that uh, refined sugar, especially when in too high quantities, is probably toxic to the body? Um, so, so even our foods that we think of as, oh, well, all food is good for you, no, not the case. Um, very much the byproducts of that food breakdown can cause a toxic response. Um, so, there's actually a lot of internal sources of toxicity. Some of these are very um, normal and natural for the human body. For example, when our immune system is fighting uh, infection, we make a lot of free radicals. It's actually a critical part of how the immune system works to cause oxidative damage to kill microbes, but that creates toxins. Um, I would also put in that category how we make energy, what's called um, oxidative phosphorylation, how we make our energy currency called ATP, makes free radicals. So I don't want to get into this, you know, realm of saying that all toxins are bad and, you know, our goal is to have no toxin creation or existence in our body. That's impossible. It is always in coexistence with us. It's, of course, a balancing act. Um, so one of the things that a lot of people don't really think about is um, our thoughts and our emotions and how they can actually be very toxic to an individual. And we can actually do some of these measurements that we finally, the science has evolved to be able to look at different thought patterns and the actual physiological breakdown products of neurotransmitters and hormones and the toxic production. So we, we can actually measure things like that. Um, Another big source of toxicity is an imbalanced microbiome. So someone mentioned leaky gut. Um, basically, we have this massive microbial community of 10 times more cell uh, microbes in our gut than there are cells in our body. And when they get out of balance and when they start to metabolize inappropriate food or interact inappropriately, they create toxins and those get absorbed into our bloodstream. So it's a major source of toxicity. A lot of that is food mediated as well, of course. Um, and then a big, big source is, you know, right, when we're looking at how does the body get rid of toxins, right? We, we're making them on our own, we're bringing them in, we gotta get rid of them. So I would consider a major source of toxic burden being compromised elimination, okay? so. That can be, you know, the bowels, the lungs, the kidneys, the skin, the liver, um, the lymphatic system. When those organ systems are really gunked up and sluggish and stagnant, um, we obviously are not eliminating toxins efficiently, and so we are accumulating in a net standpoint more is coming in that's going out. So that's a big focus of detoxification is enhancing those pathways. Um, so any questions so far about, you know, some 
concepts around sources of toxic exposure and toxic burden. Okay. So, common symptoms. You know, what, what would you expect if you were toxic or had a big toxic burden? That's kind of a trick question because I, I think almost any health-related ailment can really be attributable to a toxic or inflammatory burden. Um, so, I, I think that, you know, statement universally applies. However, I'll point to a few things that I find most commonly to be very strongly associated with accumulated toxicity. Fatigue is a big one. Allergies are a big one. Uh, dysfunctional or weakened immune system, or in other words, frequent colds and flus. Um, all sorts of intestinal issues from bloating and gas and diarrhea and constipation and heartburn and all the other kind of linked diagnoses. Um, weight gain, um, brain fog, irritability, menstrual difficulties, joint pain, um, skin rashes, anything along you know the external surface, mood changes, sleep issues, um, swelling, um, especially peripheral swelling, uh, with the uh, the hands and the feet often very common in the ankles, headaches, upper respiratory infections. So. Um, you know, to just name a few, uh, breath, uh, breathing impairments like asthma, uh, shortness of breath, and, um, you know, the list kind of goes on and on, but those are some of the biggies that I find to be very successfully mitigated by a good detoxification or fasting protocol. So, um, let's kind of lead into that definition. So, if we talked about what a toxin is, is something that harms physiological processes in the body, then detoxification is the neutralization, transformation, or removal of toxic burden from the body. Typically, that involves the reduced intake of toxins combined with the enhanced elimination of existing toxins. So when we talk about our detox protocol, at the root of it, it's going to be reducing our intake while amplifying our removal of toxic burden. Um, so, methodologies, and this is where we're going to kind of broaden out a little bit and spend a little extra time. There's a lot of different definitions of what a detox is. On its really most simple level, detoxification or a detox protocol could be making a commitment to not eat refined sugars for a period of a month or a week, right? That's limiting the intake of a toxin from the body. Um, so, for a lot of people, it would do profound health benefit to simply remove uh, processed foods from their diet. Um, so that's anything in a package, a box, a, a bag, anything that when you look at it, it doesn't resemble the plant it came from. That's processed food. So that could be a very powerful detoxification protocol. Um, when we get a little more aggressive with that, we can um, kind of isolate dietary intake toward exclusively uh, fibers, fruits, and vegetables. And in the protocol that we're going to be going over, the first introductory phase in the group detox is a um, exclusively high fiber fruit and vegetable intake. So that's where the program as we ease into the fast starts. If we broaden beyond that, um, we can look at doing something called juice fasting. This is um, engaging the concept of physiological fasting, meaning turning off the process of digestion uh, while still taking in nutrients. The more extreme form of that is water fasting. And this is probably the most aggressive form of detoxification. It is when an individual consumes only water for a period of time, whether that be 12 hours, 24 hours, or two to ten days. Um, I've water fasted individuals for as much as a week before. The thing about water fasting is all of the energy to run our physiological systems have to come from internally. So that also means we're dumping our toxic burden at a really, really rapid rate. And typically protocols like that for longer than a day or two need to be supervised in a medical setting where we're doing regular <coughs> blood work and actually, ideally, even in an inpatient setting where an individual can just kind of hang out and not do a heck of a lot.
because there's not a lot of energy reserve to perpetuate that long term. Um, so that's not something we'll be really engaging too much with, um, unless it is maybe adding a day onto the end of the juice fast of water fasting. Um, but a really powerful therapy. So um, another form of detoxification that I'm not a huge fan of are so-called supplemented product-based detoxes, the whole kind where you buy a jug of powder with a million different ingredients in it and um, you know fistfuls of capsules of supplements and take those as a you know detox, which doesn't resonate with me very well because it seems like if our liver and body are working so hard to process things dumping out of our toxic load, adding a bunch of supplements in the mix is really going to be um, burdensome to the system. So the protocols I work on with most people are pretty much exclusively food-based, um, with maybe a couple of really selective nutrients to enhance certain detoxification pathways. Um, so questions so far about kind of methodologies, what detoxification is, any clarifications? If we undertake the uh, program with you, yeah. do we undergo blood work at uh, your clinic? Um, it would be an option certainly to pursue some blood work, but it's not a standardized part of the okay. protocol again because it's not a water fast. Okay. So it's one where I feel very safe about people's physiological systems. Um, the major ones remaining in homeostasis. Um, I'm not concerned about electrolytes going way out of balance. Basically, you know, the water fasting can create life-threatening consequences if not monitored appropriately, and that's the context where I want to be doing blood work. Now, would it be interesting to have a pre- and post-fast set of blood work to compare objectively the changes that happen in your body? Absolutely, and um, that's something that I have done with many of my patients to just really look at the benefit and efficacy of a, a known blood marker issue and what how it responds to the, the detox or the fast. But it's not necessary to run laps. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Are you going to talk about the specifics like of the bulking some more now? You know? I will, yeah. I'll, t I'll talk a little bit about the protocol in broad strokes. I won't go into intimate detail because that's more, this is an introductory kind of concept of, you know, uh, what you're looking at undergoing and what the reasons and rationale behind it. So, but I'll, I'll touch on it. Yeah. Yeah, back. So water fast is just strictly water. You want to incorporate any sort of teas like dandelion? Yeah, I mean, there's some debate about that. I, I think, you know, I would personally be um, not opposed to using some medicinal detoxifying teas with water fast. Yeah, I, I think that would be acceptable. Depends on how much of you are. And of course, your water's got to be good filtered water. Yeah, quality of water is something we touch on in, in the first lecture of the detox because water can be a source of toxicity too. So we have to really examine the quality of it. Yeah. Yes? Um, can you talk about intermittent fasting? Sure, yeah. I was just going to launch into that, so perfect segue. <laughs> um, so intermittent fasting. I'm going to go into a little more detail on some of these concepts. Um, the premise of intermittent fasting is to take a period out of a 24-hour period and very intentionally um, not consume any calories or fiber. Um, the kind of definition of intermittent fasting could be anything from overnight, right? If you go in to do blood work and I say, can you fast? Well, going from dinner to the next morning is a 8 to 10 hour fast, right? So technically that's a a 10 hour fast, right? So intermittent fasting, we're being a little arbitrary in defining how long you're withholding from consuming any calories or food. Um, typically, the way that I talk about intermittent fasting, there's a lot of different definitions. I like to look at it in a standpoint of um, giving a 16 to 18 hour window between the last meal of one day and the first meal of the next day. Um, now that can be done all seven days a week, it can be done two days a week, it can be done one day a week. I usually say the more days a week it's done, the more efficacious the clinical benefit of it. Typically I kind of balance out around five days a week of doing that. And um, 
Again, different definitions will say all that really matters is that big period of fasting, the, um, how much you eat between the, when you break the fast and your last meal of the day doesn't matter very much. I personally feel like the, one of the whole concepts of intermittent fasting is to reorganize the metabolism. So a lot of it is about removing the burden of digestion and letting your liver and uh, digestive organs recalibrate how they um, process and assimilate uh, the food we eat. So I like to actually promote two meals a day, so that 16 to 18 hour window, with, for most people it works out the first meal being lunch, lunchish time and the second meal being dinner time. Um, it could be breakfast and lunch, but usually about that, you know, five to six hour window between the first and the second meal with no snacking. So that really, I think, sets you up for the best metabolic benefits. Some of the instances that I really like to use intermittent fasting are blood sugar issues. Um, it's a really, uh, it's a really consistent and um, maintainable way to promote weight loss. Um, so I find it really beneficial because inevitably when you're eating twice a day, you usually end up eating a lot less calories. And um, that's with a few exceptions of people who are really prone to overeating, who I've found don't do well with intermittent fasting. Um, so that's a big caveat is how you intermittent fast. So the next concept there is, well, what are those meals got to look like to be successful at this? And I think the fat content becomes really critical because metabolically speaking, fat burns really slowly and so we want to be consuming plenty of that macronutrients so that the meals stick with us and we metabolize efficiently. One of the concepts here usually is intermittent fasting for a lot of people is in also regards to promoting weight loss and so we often will want to um, really get the body breaking down fat so Focusing more on fat as one of the primary caloric drivers of your main meal is really helpful there. So I usually am promoting uh, really good oils, a lot of fibrous vegetables, and some clean proteins. And not tons and tons of starches. Maybe a little whole fruit, maybe a little whole grain, but by and large, um, you know, a lot of fibrous veggies and, and good fats and oils. Um, when we look at the physiology of intermittent fasting, what we see is that after about 12 hours, the body depletes most of its glycogen stores. And glycogen is a, it's a short-term storage module in the liver for energy use, so it, it's very easily converted into glucose and then energy. Um, but after about 12 hours, that's mostly burned out. So at that point, the body starts going looking for energy, and usually beyond that 12-hour period, we can start diving into fat reserves. And so again, that's where Weight loss is one of my primary targets for intermittent fasting. Um, I think overarchingly, conceptually, the benefit of fasting is we've done a ton of research on it, so we know what it does physiologically for the body. Um, we know that it dramatically increases longevity, both in human and animal models. Um, even arguably in some animal models, increasing lifespan as much as 50% um, by doing some form of regular fasting. So it's, it's a pretty powerful extender of life and one of the big contributors, contributors to that is the fact that when we are in a fasting state, our body is able to dramatically reallocate resources to cellular repair processes, scavenging free, ox, free radicals, removing oxidative species from the body, and going about repairing cellular and DNA structures. Um, so add to that the fact that you're not bringing in any toxins, so to speak, because a lot of, as I said, our toxic exposure is through food, and add into that all of the energy liberated for not having to digest food, you can kind of see physiologically how this is so valuable. Um, some of the research that has been done is in relation to chronic cardiovascular issues like heart disease, diabetes. Um, it's been very well researched to show how enhanced immunological markers are with the process of fasting. Um, 
I, I would say that, again, pretty much any chronic disease state can benefit from this uh, process, which is why I participate with the class twice a year, but I even do fasting myself beyond on a at least quarterly basis uh, because the health benefits, there's really nothing that compares to it in terms of an action that can be undertaken to really improve longevity and vitality. Um, of course, there's a lot of really foundational things like good sleep and um, you know exercise and stress modulation, um, diet in the long term. Obviously, these are huge forces in health, but in terms of an intervention that can be very related to nature, I, I really consider fasting one of the most powerful tools. Um, and so I, I know that probably that's a, a, a word that elicits a lot of fear in a lot of people. Um, it's one of the reasons why the group that does the detox, I kind of recommend they don't chat a lot about to just the whole world that they're doing a fast because it's very misunderstood in the conventional medical world, unfortunately, even though we have all this great research around it. The whole concept of going without food for any period of time is so, um, it's so foreign and unfamiliar to our culture. Um, although, if you look at nature, um, we see fasting all over the place. Um, you know, if you ever look at a sick animal or an injured animal, what do they do? They, they stop eating, right? Reallocate resources to repair and regeneration. When children get sick or when adults get sick, you know, why is it that we lose our appetite? The body is telling us to fast so that the, it, it can more efficiently clear the virus or microbe or bacteria that is, you know, kind of set up shop and created an issue. Um, if you look back in human history, um, fasting goes back to our deepest roots, and in fact, evolutionarily, why we have such an epidemic of obesity and diabetes now is because our bodies are fine-tuned to run very efficiently in a fasting mode. Consequently, also, when food is abundant, we're really good at storing it. So in this, again, 21st century society of abundant food 24-7 for your entire life, that has created quite an issue around metabolism um, and obesity, uh, heart disease, diabetes, etc. Um, so, you know, very much it is incredibly normal and adaptive to human physiology to fast for periods of days, really. And, and we're very capable of that. Um, yeah? I just had a question. You were talking about the healthy fats, but yeah. it seems like so many people talk about you have to eat all this extra protein. Yeah. Like they like they're saying like a smidgen of fat and don't yeah. just eat protein. Yeah. Well, if we go back to the longevity studies, actually they point to the opposite. They point to um, uh, an inverse curve in longevity with the more protein intake you have. So I think there's a lot of fad diets out there that really speak to how important you know protein is and weight loss diets where they make you eat a ton of protein. And the, the physiological rationale for that is it takes so much energy to break down the protein to get it into your body to turn into energy that it's a net zero. Of course, it's devastating on your kidneys and liver to consume that much protein on a daily basis. So I've seen all sorts of really um, long-term consequences of individuals who engage in those types of dietary regimens, especially when they yo-yo back and forth. Um, so I would disagree pretty strongly with that sentiment that a lot of protein is important um, for longevity and health. I think. It's a very individual question. For example, I think people who are O blood types need more consistent and specific levels of protein, uh, more so than other blood types, and kind of a separate conversation. But I think ultimately it comes down to the individual, what's appropriate for them. How much are they exercising? Are they a competitive athlete? Do they have other you know, disease processes where protein regulation is really Someone mentioned kidney disease. That'd be a really good place to be very specific about protein intake. Um, so it's a very individual question. Too. Uh, most uh, fruits and vegetables do have some protein in them. Very trace amounts, yes. But Mother Nature put them in that balance. Correct. So yeah. maybe that's really all we need. Yeah, I, I would say it'd be difficult. We, we were evolved <laughs> as omnivores, so it'd be difficult to have the most optimal 
vital state if you're not doing any supplementation to only eat fruits and vegetables 100% of your entire lifetime. But, um, I mean, you could eat dramatically almost everything in that regard and supplement very minorly in other categories and I think do really well. And so this detox, if you participate in it, will be exclusively whole fruit and vegetable based. Um, there's no grains, there's no meat, there's no dairy, there's no beans. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's just those food groups. Yeah. Um, since we're talking about the fasting, this is a time, hopefully I can ask now. My worry, because everything you've mentioned, it sounds like it's something I have to do. Okay. At some point soon. Um, sure. But then again, like I said, a, a certain amount of time after I'm awake, and I've noticed it now in my son, you yeah. know, oh, sorry, I've got an itch. Um, like, like nauseous because yeah. we're hungry. Nauseous, sure. dizzy, yeah. lightheaded. Sure. How do you get past that? Well, in, any of the protocol we're doing actually by design, there will never be a true period of more than four hours where you're not consuming something. Uh -huh. Now what you're consuming may be passively absorbed, okay. and that's really what a juice detox is, is, is removing the fiber from the plant um, substance right. so that all the nutrients are concentrated and then passively absorbed. So physiologically speaking, you are in a fasting state as it relates to the digestive system. Okay. Metabolically, it's not shutting down and it keeps your blood sugars really stabilized. Oh, okay. So I, I wouldn't see that as a, a necessary limitation from doing yeah. the detox. Yeah, okay. And that's why we have you to monitor us. Right, of course. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, did I, did I get your question about intermittent fasting? Yeah, I just had a follow-up question. Yeah, sure. So if you're not eating for like 16 hours, yeah. do you have caffeine before you eat? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends again on how much of a purist you are around that. Um, one, would, one could argue that the caffeine interfaces to some degree with your metabolic um, signaling pathways and might disrupt slightly the kind of metabolism of fasting. But I think that would be relatively minor, especially if it was small dose caffeine. It's, it's harder for me to justify coffee, um, but certainly green tea, or yerba mate, or even black tea, I think would be pretty minimal in what that does to that that metabolic uh, kind of signal. Do you have any tips for finding fruits and vegetables that have not been grown in depleted soils? Um, yeah, it's really challenging, actually. Yeah, one of the you know sustainable farming and using even using local. I think using local, you know, CSAs, farmers markets, one of the best ways you can go, but that doesn't guarantee soils aren't depleted. And so one of the things I promote to a lot of my patients, I'm not a supplement pusher, but I really tell people, you know, the minerals are sadly very depleted from our soils. So to really get what you need, we kind of have to, at this point in the evolution of our um, earth, supplement minerals. I to make up for that deficiency and depletion that exists. Yeah, yeah, back. Um, I just have two questions. Sure. Um, for those who are more on the hypoglycemic side, intermittent fasting, like how would you recommend stabilizing the blood sugar for them? Let's say they started at the, the first meal, like one or two. Months. Yeah. You know, again, if we follow that concept of um, really reducing carbohydrate intake and amping up fat as the main caloric. <coughs> energy currency, I find most people with hypoglycemic tendencies stabilize beautifully. We may have to work our way into that if someone has a really severe expression of that, but I mean, the vast majority of hypoglycemic issues lies on an overemphasis in carbohydrate intake in someone whose metabolism is not really responding um, efficiently to carbohydrate. That's really what creates hypoglycemia. Okay. And then the second question. To get to that stage of actual muscle <clears throat> degradation, yeah. you would have to exceed the 24-hour mark. 
um, of fasting. fasting. Yeah, so um, there is a period between about 24 hours or 48 hours where a very limited amount of protein loss happens in a water fast before the body shifts into ketosis, which is taking breaking down fat and using it as a ketone body for fuel. I've done an open forum lecture on the ketogenic diet, the real ketogenic diet, a lot of people throw that term around, <clears throat> but what actual ketosis is that really takes about two to three days to set in, and there's a very short period in the interim um, between 24 hours and 48 hours where there is a very small amount of muscle breakdown um, to sustain glucose levels while the body's transitioning into ketosis. So for the first 12, so glucose is made after 12 hours, but then what happens? Well, again, there's, there's still glycogen stores. Um, it's just um, the body is, is kind of shifting resources okay. and starting to mobilize fats more efficiently. And understand that you still have enough glucose to run the major vital organs through the, through the glycogen and other breakdown products in normal carbohydrate metabolism. But some of the surplus and the supplemental is being brought in by fat breakdown into um, one of the intermediaries that creates energy. Um, Acetyl-CoA is what it's called. So you can make a lot of acetyl-CoA before you actually are formally in ketosis to kind of augment energy production pathways. Ooh, and one of your, sorry, last question. That's um, fine. One of your uh, recommendations to use for the blood sugar issues, the weight loss, when you say weight loss, do you track or look at composition, so like water, fat, muscle? Yeah, I think that's really valuable. I have a couple of tools to measure that. I don't necessarily uniformly do that with all my patients, but I actually, you know, weight loss is such a, a poor barometer. You know, the biggest thing I work on is waist-hip ratio and how clothes fit. Um, that's what I'm much more encouraged about because from a health standpoint, those factors are much more prominent in disease and health versus just strict weight change because, you know, if someone's converting a lot of fat into more muscle density, I mean, yeah, weight change is going to be minimal, but body shape change can be dramatic. Um, you know, skin uh, calipers can be really useful in that measurement. I have specific weighing machines that kind of do some of those calculations too. So, you know, if I was someone who wanted to really target in on that process and understanding that, I can support that and guide that. But usually, you know, weight loss is considered secondary to all the other physiological benefits relating to what we're doing therapeutically. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Any other questions at this stage? Yes. <clears throat> Just a clarification. Um, you, you described the 16 to 18 hour window between meals and the intermittent yeah. fasting. How does that relate to the two meals a day? Um, so the two meals a day, you know, that basically the 16 to 18 hour window gives you some discretion as to when that period is. When the two meals are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, you could technically do it at, you know, uh, 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. You could do it at 6 a.m. and 12 noon. I mean, again, it's the concept of that period is really what we're looking for. And it's, I find that most of my patients, um, a lot of people just aren't hungry in the morning. And, you know, there's an old myth that you have to eat breakfast and that's critical to being healthy and metabolism and weight and all that. I think that's not universal. I, I think some people that really is important. And a lot of people do way better, you know, not eating their first meal in the middle of the day. Yeah. Um, so intermittent fasting tends to work really well for those people. How about children? Um, <clears throat> if there was a major obesity issue, I could consider it. But otherwise, it's very rare that I would recommend that to a child, only because their caloric need and their growth need is larger. So we should force them to eat breakfast. As well, my, my daughter doesn't want to eat breakfast, and it's like... Yeah. Well, I guess it all depends on, you know, how the rest of the calories would come in. If there's not really any actual hunger till mid-morning, I mean, another thing that I go by is listen to nature and listen to your body. So if your body's telling you you're not hungry, then probably not that important to eat. Um, so, but that doesn't mean that you eat, you know, uh, fruit, chewies, and chips at 10 a.m., right? I mean, so... 
it's all relative to that individual and, and their pattern and schedule. Yeah. And how they do. I mean, if they really are showing health issues and they're, you know, dragging in their morning classes or whatever, um, that's something to really examine closely. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I know I mentioned a couple of other modalities. I mean, one was calorie restriction. Um, personally, I find calorie restriction to be a real challenging model to sustain if you're just really counting calories. I like to go way more by concepts around food. So like the big concept I look at is fibrous vegetables. Our ancestors, 80% of our intake was fibrous vegetables. What is it about fibrous vegetables that's so great? Well, it's full of fiber, which has a million different health benefits, but particularly for the intestinal system and the microbiome, really important fiber's role. Um, it has a lot of nutrients, so fibrous vegetables are chock full of vitamins and minerals, and other what are called phytonutrients, uh, plant medicines that have all sorts of different roles in the body, antioxidants, etc. Um, and they don't have many calories. I mean, fibrous vegetables, really, you could literally, you know, eat um, a giant box of spinach, and you'd probably get maybe 30 calories out of that. It would probably take you about 100 calories to break that box of spinach down. Um, so when people are talking about caloric restriction, I like to get away from that and say, you know, eat as much you know, fibrous vegetables as you ever think you can eat and then eat 20% more than that. Because <clears throat> you're never going to be hungry, you'll be very satisfied, and you'll be essentially working off a major caloric deficit with a major nutrient abundance. Um, of course, <clears throat> to make that kind of um, stay with you and not be immediately hungry again, you do need to complement that with some sort of caloric source and usually again fat is my number one guidance there because it burns slowly it doesn't cause this hypoglycemic pattern that someone was mentioning which is that when you eat carbs it stimulates insulin insulin brings the carbs and the sugar into the bloodstream but what it does is it bottoms out your blood sugar and gives you a lower blood sugar than what your baseline was and then all the hunger signals are triggered and you want to eat again. So a lot of people are really successful with low-carb diets because it really mitigates that insulin roller coaster that causes us to get hungry all the time and end up eating a lot. Um, so when we're talking about you know, calorie restriction, I like to talk about the fibrous vegetables because that makes a lot of physiological and rational sense. And I also like to talk about the diminishment of uh, carbohydrate as the major component of where we derive calorie from. Um, part of that is that that insulin signal that mitigates blood sugar also mitigates signaling in the body whether the body is in the fed state or the fasting state. So in the fed state, meaning there's a lot of energy around, Insulin is the signal that tells the body to make and store fat. Whereas in the fasting state, um, there's no insulin around, and there's a lot of what's called glucagon, which tells the body there's no energy around, so let's break down our existing stores to run off of, basically. Um, so if we focus on a really low carbohydrate density diet, um, and I mean caloric carbs, right? All fibrous vegetables are carbs, but they're fiber. They're not calories, right? So starches is what I'm really after here. Um, if we reduce the caloric density carbohydrates, um, basically what we're doing is we're not punching that insulin signal. And so the body more easily can um, utilize existing stores of energy for breakdown. And that, and that synergizes really nicely with a calorie deficit if you're doing something like that. So you're talking about with the fiber with the vegetables. Um, what about like these, in comparison nutrition wise, like all these super high fiber cereals? Yeah, high fiber cereals are a similar concept, except they, you know, they have starch with them. I mean, cereal by definition comes from a grain, and unless you're like literally processing everything out, but like the whole, 
I mean like psyllium or something, then you know you're getting carbohydrate load with that. Certainly you can have really high fiber content in relation to the starch content, and that's good. Um, but I don't think that it's really comparable to fibrous vegetables. And the nutrient density in grains is nothing like the nutrient density in live vegetables. Yeah. So yes. what would you suggest the caloric intake for carbs be per day? It depends on the individual. That's such a, especially, you know, activity level, um, body build, genetics, um, what the intended medical outcomes are of the okay. protocol. Um, it's so dependent. So I mean, I've seen a standardized version that like, yeah. it was like seventy percent carbs. Yeah, I, I would I would disagree with that statement in terms of where the calories come from. I would probably put you know no more than fifty percent carbs for the vast majority of individuals as a, as a calorie source. I mean that's super generalization. It's right. not saying much, but right. I, I would disagree with seventy percent for sure. Um, now, if you were talking about total intake of fiber and caloric carbohydrate, yeah. then, because fiber is carbohydrate, then 70% or more is pretty accurate. Sure. Yeah. Because when you read a label on a food label, when it says carbs, you have to be careful because the total carbohydrate includes the fiber. So you always have to subtract the fiber from the total carbs. That's the starch-based or caloric carbohydrate you're intaking. <clears throat> so, you know, you know, a head of broccoli might be uh, 20 grams of carbs. The thing about that is 18 of those grams is fiber. Right? So you're only actually absorbing 2 grams of caloric carbs. Fiber does not absorb into the bloodstream. Right? That's part of the physiology of digestion. Yeah, any questions around some of those specific methodologies of fasting and intermittent fasting, um, calorie restriction? Uh, I was wondering, do you have to uh, reduce your physical demands if you're doing a standard juice? Um, I would say that my counsel I give is that very intensive, vigorous exercise, like say CrossFit, during the juicing phase of the protocol, especially the latter parts, I would recommend going really light in something like that, high intensity exercise. But actually, I really promote exercise during the detox, but usually ask people to gravitate, especially in the, the juice fast, to more gentle forms. So um, no weightlifting? I wouldn't do a lot of it. Maybe very targeted amounts is appropriate, uh, but not like really long, intense sessions, mm -hmm. because you won't be consuming a, a large amount of protein. And as you break down those muscles, it's really valuable to have protein around to help them rebuild stronger. Right. So I wouldn't do a bunch of weightlifting just during that five day phase. Okay. Yeah. Any question to that? Okay. 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 So um, I thought that I could kind of launch toward a discussion of you know the principles of detoxification as it relates to our program. Uh, is everyone ready for that? Okay, cool. So, you know, kind of a little backdrop to this conversation. Um, my, my background in detoxification medicine, um, as a naturopathic physician, I would really call our, um, our I guess, predecessors of our profession, the um, nature cure movement in Europe, to be really the foundation of detoxification medicine which naturopathic medicine in the United States was kind of emerged from in the early 20th century. So the real foundational principles of naturopathic medicine are improving circulation, improving elimination, um, uh, bringing in clean foods, fasting or clean foods, and um, you know, really engaging with stress detoxifying. And so in large part, really in going back to detoxification, we're really looking at our roots. And I truly find that there is not a patient I see in my office that wouldn't benefit from some form of detoxification, even if it's just very simple, like I said, removing processed food. Um, I really think that basically anyone could dramatically benefit from um, the concepts that are contained in detox. And so personally for me, um, 
I had a profound health transformation when I was in my first year of medical school by engaging in a protocol not too different from this from one of my mentors. And so at that point, I was just hooked on seeing how profoundly my health could be experienced in a different way by just, you know, choosing what I put into and eliminate from my body. And so it has really become a passion of mine to research and learn in depth about this study of detoxification medicine and teach it as a tool to my patients. Um, because one of the values of that when I say tool is that it's not a medicine that you need to keep coming back for or keep taking. It's, it's truly um, the learning about how your body works and observing the responsiveness to the protocol that allows you to you know, take these tools and use them for the rest of your life. So I'm really excited with the group program to be able to offer these really in-depth lectures to give a lot of context and detail to what the process is about and why. So what I'm going to do right now is speak very briefly to some of those principles, knowing that if you choose to uh, participate in the group program, we're going to go into a lot more detail through all these principles. Um, okay. So, um, you know, in a foundational place, again, speaking to naturopathic medicine, detoxification is founded upon the principle of the body's intrinsic ability to heal itself. So in other words, another way of saying that is all we need to be in vibrant health is already contained within our body. Uh, we already have the capability. What we really need to do, first and foremost, is remove obstacles to health. So I talk about this a lot with my patient base, is that, hey, 90% of what we got to do here is remove the obstacles for your body intuitively doing what it knows how to do to heal itself. So that's first and foremost. And how we you know, contextualize that in the definition of detoxification is reducing exposure to toxic intake, right? So when we detox, we are dramatically reducing the exposure to obstacles to health, basically. Um, another big, big concept in fasting and detoxification is improving circulation and using a variety of methods to enhance how the body mobilizes resources. Right? I mean, I liken, um, you know, our, our bloodstream and lymphatic system to highways um, of how we distribute nutrients and get rid of trash. If our circulation is stagnated and not efficient, then we're going to have a real hard time removing toxins from the body and getting all those great nutrients we're bringing in to the tissues to undergo repair processes. So some of the things we'll be talking about is contrast hydrotherapy, um, dry skin brushing, lymphatic massage, um, hydration, uh, exercise. These are major methodologies to really enhance um, circulatory properties of uh, the cardiovascular and lymphatic system. Okay. Another big uh, principle, we already touched on this, enhance elimination. So specifically, we're going to target in and go into great depth on the liver, the bowels, the kidneys, the lungs, the skin, and the lymphatics. And we're going to talk about how to enhance um, eliminatory pathways in those organ systems. Again, tremendous number of lifestyle and external applications to enhance that. There are some nutrients we'll talk about, some plant-based medicines that can support those processes. Uh, but really, really key to a successful detox or fast. What I find is that most people who have had experiences detoxing or fasting and have had negative or, um, you know, uh, a uh, adverse reaction to them is because they have not been guided in this really critical component of circulation and elimination and just how important that is. So we'd be really going into a lot of detail um, in that second lecture primarily is where we really hit that hard. So and a lot of the information will be contained in the guidebook around that as well. Um, <clears throat> repairing the gastrointestinal system. So my bias as a naturopathic physician is that the gut is the seat of health. Um, so if we don't have an intestinal system that is 
breaking down and absorbing and assimilating efficiently, then nothing downstream of that can be working very well. And it happens to be in our modern society, both with the physiological effects of chronic stress and the physiological effects on the gut of our standard American processed diet, that our intestinal systems by and far are very compromised. Um, so when we do especially a fasting state, we take those rapidly um, repairing cells of the intestinal lining and we give them a break. Um, you know, we're constantly digesting food and this is one of the problems with going away from our ancestry of juggling fasting state with food abundance is that the gut's never given a rest and probably the most therapeutic way to repair the intestinal lining is to fast. Um, of course, we have this whole microbiome to think about and how that interfaces with the process and it's a very complicated picture. Um, we spend time in one of the lectures really understanding digestive physiology in a lot of detail so that we can really get from a just general grasp really what the process of digestion is and what all goes into creating optimal digestive um, function. So big thing as one of the principles of detoxing. Questions so far? Okay. Um, stimulate the liver. So I really see the liver as kind of the workhorse organ in the body from an internal detoxification standpoint. Essentially, any toxin that's being dumped from your fat cells into your bloodstream or wherever it is residing in your tissues needs to be metabolized first and foremost through the liver unless you're sweating it out, which is part of why we're going to talk a lot about saunas and sweating because it's a really good way to bypass the work the liver has to do to remove toxins from the body. So um, a big focus of parts of our education, the protocol is going to be how to understand the liver, how it works, the phase one, phase two detox pathways, and how to support and enhance that during a detox. And a lot of the actual foods you'll be eating are really liver restorative and liver friendly, and the juices you'll be doing. So, yeah. Is there a difference between the traditional uh, sauna and the far infrared? Um, there are some subtle differences, but from the standpoint of more broadly what we're examining, not really. Um, the sweating is the real physiological benefit we're after. Because yeah. you don't sweat as much in the car. Right? Well, you can. You just have to hang out a little longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just takes a little longer to get a good sweat going. But they will elicit the same response. So obviously there will be saunas for us to find? There will Close be five. discussions okay. about yeah, how to, to utilize okay. the sauna. And again, it's not a necessity. It's not a requirement. But it's yeah. a great enhancement. Yeah. Um, so, last, and le last but not least is transforming stress. Um, so I like to really emphasize that, you know, if we are on a deadline and working ourselves to the bone and trying to do a detox at the same time, some of the benefits are definitely going to be negated. I remember one year I personally kind of witnessed that in a really time where I was kind of out of balance with my, you know, stress and self-care. So. Uh, one of the focuses and intentions we're going to set in this period is to really create a space for practicing self-compassion and self-care in this. And part of that means really working with um, how the mind is involved and connected with the body in relation to health and toxicity. So another important component as a principle. Um, so any questions about the general principles of detoxification? Awesome. So, you know, if you want to talk about benefits, um, so many that I can bring up. Um, I, I've listed a few in my little cheat sheet I created. Um, oftentimes, um, obviously, energy, vitality are, are dramatic um, changes for people. Weight reduction, reduction in allergic symptoms, improvement in digestive function, um, better moods, better concentration, better sleep. Um, Reduced inflammation and pain is a very common finding. A um, lot of anti-aging effects, we talked about that. Uh, sleep quality, um, 
chronic disease reduction, major benefits to the immune system. So perfect thing to do in the fall leading into cold, cold and flu season is something like a, a detox protocol. So those are kind of just to name a few, uh, but really the list goes on and on it's an, and it's infinite. So um, moving forward from that, I wanted to kind of segue into talking about some of the details of the program that we do through Coeur d'Alene Healing Arts. So before I go into that, um, to kind of uh, re-examine our conversation, is there anything we left off that related to the detox and fasting topic, not these topics that um, we want to make sure to cover? So usually that's a conversation as part of the, the lecture is, you know, to really talk about which nutrients may or may not be appropriate, either ongoing supplements or other to continue using. So um, I would be happy to, if we were doing, you were doing the protocol or someone to really review, you know, what's suggested detox supporting agents and if that's appropriate or necessary, you know, based on the individual as well as just what the nutrient being proposed. So certainly some are very appropriate. I just like to help discern what that is because this is a very guided protocol, so I'm not just kind of turning it loose. Um, yeah, I think that's a, an important point to emphasize is that, you know, this is a guided protocol, so people will come in and say, well, I found this on the internet, what do you think of this detox? Like, well, maybe, but, you know, these are pretty significant physiological shifts happening in your body and it's really helpful to have someone with expertise and a lot of experience with it um, kind of guide you through that process. And so a great part about that is that you have access to me the entirety of the protocol. So I give everyone my cell phone number so if anything comes up at any time we can connect and adjust what we're doing or um, address symptoms if and when they should arise or clarify questions. Um, so that guidance, I think, is really supportive in this protocol. Um, this was designed over 30 years ago, the original iteration, and since I have evolved it even more. So many, many thousands of people have used this protocol with some adaptation. So I have a, a pretty good confidence in its track record and its kind of successibility for people. It's very individualized, and so before we do the protocol, I send out emails for non-patients asking very in-depth individual health histories so that we can really gather um, any sort of adaptations that may be necessary. We'll talk through supplementation, what to maintain, what not to, and make appropriate individual adjustments. Um, it's also all food-based, I think I mentioned that. I really like using food as medicine, so you know, it can be very frustrating to pay for a detox and then pay for a big bag of supplements that aren't even necessarily going to help you too much. And so all of your intake is going to be derived from whole foods. So that's kind of some of the most salient points of what this detox looks like. Now, I'm going to go over the structure of it in terms of what you can expect. Um, so the first class, there's, there's actually four classes. We're going to try something new this year and do a fourth class to kind of create a little more space for projecting out into the future and giving more broad guidelines towards nutrition and health. So we want to create a little more space for that. So the format is going to be Thursday evening, Sunday afternoon, the following Thursday evening, and the following Sunday afternoon, with the last one being kind of optional. So you're going to be in a 14-day protocol, and that is based on three phases. Um, how the classes are structured is that you come to the class the day before you start the next phase. So we can overview what's to come and connect about kind of what you've been experiencing. <clears throat> so the first class is on a Thursday evening at 6.30 here, uh, so next Thursday actually. And um, it preps us to begin what's called the bulking phase, 
bulking phase of the diet is the first three days, so that's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, it encompasses a whole fruits and vegetable diet with some liver flushes, a lot of fiber going on. We're basically scraping out the intestinal system and gently bringing the body into a, a detox mode, really ramping up hydration, improving elimination pathways. We then meet again on Sunday late afternoon around 4.30, and I have a second lecture. It goes over a lot of, each lecture will have its own education components, but the second lecture will also foreshadow the upcoming juice fast portion of the protocol, which is five days for the, at least the standard program with the option to extend that. And that will be Monday through Friday, and basically, You'll be doing a modified juice fast, and I say modified is because rather than asking everybody to do colonics or enemas, which are particularly pleasant or desirable for a lot of people, we do a high fiber morning smoothie um, that's consumed over a one to two hour period to keep the bowels active, but the remainder of the day is composed of vegetable juices. Um, so that's where we're actually going into a juice fast for those five days. Can we actually be doing any juicing here? Um, yeah, so there's a few options. The two tools that are really necessary if you're going to be composing all of your own food are a blender and a juicer. A juicer is, again, what removes the fiber. A blender keeps the fiber in but pulverizes it. If you don't have those tools, they're very affordable and accessible, especially if you look for them secondhand. Um, you can also buy juices, and there will be some discounts offered at some of the juice shops in town to stock up on your juices for the day at some of the juice bars. And you can have them custom make those formulas if you'd like. It's a more spendy way to go, but if you don't want to bother with the hassle of it and spend the time juicing or buying a juicer, then it's an option. Um, so that's what happens with the second class as we foreshadow the Monday through Friday juice fast. And then we meet again on Thursday to foreshadow the reintroduction phase of the protocol. And this is how we're going to methodically review how to reintroduce foods, which is one of the benefits I didn't mention, is how helpful the reintroductory phase is to identifying food sensitivities. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking to learn about what foods you're sensitive to, probably the most efficient way to do so is to do a protocol like this, where we really reduce the body's inflammatory burden so it gets really sensitive if you're reintroducing food correctly, to what foods um, are unfriendly to your system. Um, so we'll be covering that in detail. We'll talk about extending the fast um, for certain individuals who'd like to do that. And with every class, there's a lot of um, kind of uh, sharing about the experience. And so you'll see certain individuals auditing the detox for a reduced price, meaning They've already participated, but they're back because they really appreciate the support and camaraderie to help get through what can be, you know, a challenging process for a lot of people. You know, that all being said, I, I, I consider it, I call it like a working class fast because I don't ask anybody to, you know, consider stopping working or taking vacation or dropping their daily responsibilities. I think the vast, vast majority of people can be very successful doing this in the context of, you know, their daily lives. So um, the only groups I really contraindicate this for is for pregnant or breastfeeding mothers, um, young children, teenagers are yes or no depending on the individual circumstance, um, and people with really severe liver pathologies. Um, a couple areas where I'd want to be having a conversation, someone mentioned kidneys, I would want to have a conversation around it if someone had a cancer diagnosis. But, you know, basically beyond that, I think anybody is, um, you know, a good candidate to do this protocol. Um, so, kind of questions so far about the, um, the, the structure of the classes and kind of how that looks. Okay. So, well, yeah. yeah, because this is the first I'm learning about it. So, but I did see there's forms for us to fill out. Right. Yeah. So, so how do we register? Yeah, so let me just go over the details. Okay. Um, I have a um, clipboard in the back, yeah. and um, it's there's one that's just informational that I passed around that's different than the one that's the for formal the, the, yeah. sign up for the Juice Detox. And 
with this year with timing, we had to crunch this lecture a little close to it. So it is beginning next Thursday. Right. Um, and technically, the last day to register is tomorrow, although we do have a little flex because right now, I think we have uh, 12 seats in the class remaining available. So we, we cap it at 30 participants just so we can really make sure everyone is able to you know, communicate effectively in the classes. Yeah. So we have about 12 spots left. Um, so in an ideal world, anybody who is going to do this um, either would register tonight um, or call our clinic tomorrow, which you can see our information on our business card website. Yeah, how do I pay for it? Like, how do I register? Yeah, so paying for it, the, the cost would be $100. And what $100 covers is all of the support series, the guidebook, it's about a 50-page guidebook that comes with it to guide us through the process, and all of the lectures and individual support given for that process. So you could write a check tonight if you wanted to, or um, and make it out to Coeur d'Alene Healing Arts, and then your, your space would be reserved basically at that point. Or you could call the clinic and confirm with credit cards so we okay. can reserve your spot tomorrow, and that's yeah, totally okay. I, I mean, my check. That's totally okay. fine. So what I would say is if you are sincerely interested and want to participate, um, put your name on the sheet. On and, it, yeah. and if we haven't heard from you by noon tomorrow, okay. um, I'll probably have my staff reach out in the afternoon to confirm whether or not you indeed want to reserve that seat, knowing yeah. that there's currently about 12 seats remaining. So um, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of the yeah. registration process. Perfect. Thank and starting tomorrow, individuals who are registered will actually receive a kind of one week in advance email going over a lot more details in terms of how to prepare, um, especially because some people get a little antsy about shopping before. So I give a little shopping guide and, and that will all be included in that. Non-patients will get an additional email that goes over a lot of their individual health history um, so that I can be made aware of any needs in terms of adaptations. Um, any questions about kind of some of those specifics? Yes. How often do you do the detox? It's done twice a year as a group setting. Um, I'll do it individually with established patients as well. So typically it's done in early May and mid to late September. Um, and some people will sometimes ask, well, what if I have to miss one out of the four classes? That's totally possible and happens regularly. And in that context, usually what I will do is hop on the phone with that individual and kind of summarize some of the salient points of the missed lecture. Um, and what we're actually doing after this detox is we're actually going to record um, a, a kind of condensed down version of the detox that I'm hoping to give um, to individuals as, as a support um, moving forward into the protocol. So it is possible to miss a class. We just want to know if you're going to miss and then you know, discuss how to make sure you're on the same page as everyone. Yes. Can someone report a kidney participating? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, not a problem at all. I mean, I think one of the focuses is really, you know, improving kidney function by really focusing on good hydration. So I would see no problem there. Can you take cash? We could take cash as well. Yeah, um, I would just maybe want someone to, you know, make sure they first mark their name and, uh, you know, a little asterisk with cash and then maybe just bring it up to me. So or would you rather I call them tomorrow? I think if it's easier for you to bring cash, that's totally fine with me and I'm happy to collect them. Yeah. Any other questions regarding the program and kind of, you know, yeah, the look okay. of it? I'll just ask it a quick question. Yeah. So doing, you know, filling out our history, yeah. um, like I said, we just moved here. I've yeah. searched and every search you come up okay. as the doctor that's going to be our doctor, a family okay. doctor. Okay. You. Okay. That's yeah. the path we take. Sure. Um, so I can become or establish my records at the same time? Usually what we want to do, um, if you end up wanting to become a new patient, yeah. is we still do um, ideally look at establishing a new patient consult just because oh, yeah, really that's such a, you know, I really am a passionate believer in person-centered healthcare and, yeah. and in order to really provide that. Um, I really want to be a, a compassionate listener and get to know 
the unique forces that impact travel. So I guess, so it's, but it's not imperative. If it's not imperative to be established. Before, before Absolutely we start? Absolutely not, okay. yeah. That's why I send out that precursor email, because if you're not going to establish patient, yeah. I want to learn the really critical things necessary to That's guide, the bad you, health stuff. Okay. guide you effectively through the detox Perfect. and okay. modify if necessary. Okay. Knowing that this is not a panacea for health, that you know, if there are very specific health, chronic health concerns, that yeah. you know, I'm not advocating that this detox will somehow cure right. Right. Okay. all of those things, but very possibly can lead to improvements. Good step. Good exactly. Step. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. yeah. Panic push. Um, if trying to make this simple, if one is doing some adapting of this, yeah. So, or one's husband is, yeah, sure. And working full time, sure. and you know, have some concern about energy and the protein. Um, in the bulking time when there's basically no protein going in, maybe a little bit of seeds, uh -huh. it's okay to supplement with a little bit more of something simple like pea protein. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, I could see that being valid to just be doing a like totally, you know, whole foods, fruits and vegetable focused diet with very small adjunctives of easily digested protein. And again, you know, like sunflower seed or pumpkin seed might be really good adjunctives there too, along with some pea protein. Okay. And um, and then on the intermittent fasting, if anything is, I'm guessing, still beneficial. So if you're doing 12 hours, 14 hours, if you can't get up to that 16 to 18, it's still going to help the system. Absolutely. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And again, it's a very individual question, so I don't necessarily think everyone benefits from that. But some individuals want to know. So, yeah. Just as a matter of cost, do you know about how much one would be spending On food? Um, on you know, so, so Pilgrims gives a discount. That's a nice thing about us doing it here, oh, is they good. give a 10% um, discount for the duration of the protocol for uh, the produce section. Um, you know, I would say for one individual, um, Probably you're looking at, you know, a cost of, you know, $10 a day in, in food cost. I mean, it's all vegetables, so it's not even absolutely essential for it to all be organic. That's preferred, but I don't think the cost is, is that dramatic. It might be a little more during the juicing phase, like $14 or $15, just because you're, you know, really concentrating the nutrients. But, you know, I find it very reasonable cost-wise. You know, carrot and celery juice is the main staple. And those are pretty inexpensive ingredients. So. Sometimes yeah. you can get, um, you know, bulk organic. I mean, not as ideal as local, but that Costco for carrot and celery, celery kind yeah. of varies. Yeah, and Trader Joe's if you go to Spokane. And, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of options. Yeah, uh, it doesn't have to be all got bought from here, but it's nice that they do offer that little discount there. Yeah. If anyone's planning on investing in a juicer and doesn't have one, do you have any specific? Yeah, good question. That'll come out in the email. Okay. I'll talk about specifics, but the, the more efficient, um, also more costly ones, are the auger-based juicers, the ones that crush the vegetables versus lysing or exploding them. Um, those are called centrifugal, the ones that spin. So the augers that grate the That's vegetable kidding, down. Right? Is that masticating? masticating yeah. Yes, masticating juicer is the yeah. right term. Okay. Those are the most ideal. Um, Champion and Omega are good um, sources of those. And they use less heat. Yes, they do, which is why the, the plant nutrients are preserved a lot more efficiently through that method. And you never know, maybe in the class, a couple people have those juicers and they say, hey, come on over to my house and juice. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Ultimately, the best juicer is the juicer you're going to use, right? So yeah, good. That's the key. I have an Omega. I have an omega. Okay, great. I love awesome. it. Yeah. Me too. Love it. Love it. Love it. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Okay. Any final questions about kind of detox? Okay. Cool. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. One more. Uh, so if one wants to just do um, kind of a little one day a week detox cleanse, um, liquids only. Sure. That's okay. Sure. Just use sensible how you how what you're taking in. Yeah, yeah, I think, again, the concept of fasting is that there's a lot of physiological benefit on any basis, whether that's one day a week, a 
concentrated week every quarter, um, intermittent fasting. I mean, they all have some of those physiological properties of fasting that the body really benefits from. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, if you are interested and want to you know, reserve a seat, we have the sign-up sheet in the back, um, more info about our clinic, um, video that will be posted on our website. So I welcome any of you to join and look forward to that. Um, I'm going to hang and go over these questions and also stay around after for additional questions if individuals have them. So I want to be you know, kind of polite about our time. It is 8, so individuals need to leave. Feel free. Want to stick around for these and hang out and talk with me or whatever? Also, feel free to do that. Um, so, if you're ready to take off, thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh -huh. I look forward to uh, having you as my doctor. Oh, thanks. I'll see you soon. Sounds good. Yeah, so um, a Malvin question. Um, who had that one? Yes. Okay. Great. So, I'm a big fan of removing them. Um, now, amalgams are. What an amalgam is, is a, is a dental filling that contains mercury, um, pretty high percentage of mercury. And they don't really do them these days anymore, although some unconscionable dentists still do. So most people's amalgams are pretty old. One of the things that means is that a lot of the off-gassing has already happened. And so that's important to kind of be aware of, that you know if they're 20 years old, they're not like, you know, profoundly devastating your health, most likely. <clears throat> However, they still have some mercury left in them, and the off-gassing of that mercury can be assimilated in the body tissue, and that's ideally something that we want to minimize. And so, proper amalgam removal is a really valuable tool, and when we look at that, I refer to very specific dentists who have a lot of education in that realm. There's a guy named Corey Harker in this area in Coeur d'Alene, it's Corey Harker, H-A-R-K-E-R, good guy, younger dentist, but you know he took over a holistic dental practice, and I think he does a really good job. Um, so I, he, basically, it's, it's an extraction process where there's a lot of venting and dental dam procedures, and just making sure that none of that mercury is, you know, seeping into the body as the removal process happens. Um, so. Oftentimes, you know, there'll be an option of doing four at a time or two at a time. Or, and it really is on an individual basis how I'll recommend that process be done. So we could certainly talk more about that. And sometimes I will recommend... Is that something the dentist would be? or The dentist would many, probably propose, you know, different options. And we could, you know, review what the options are and what's appropriate and what it's going to take. Um, sometimes I will do systemic support around, um, you know, scavenging any free radical metals. Um, so there are some protocols we can complement the removal process with, but generally that we don't need to do that extensively. It's really just finding a good dentist to do the work. Yeah. So I think, you know, my mouth were full of amalgams. I would certainly want to at some point work on the removal. I probably, for most people with really old amalgams, don't feel like it is the most pressing I find more often to get into trouble with things like root canals with people when there's issues around those, and you know that's that's something that I like to kind of investigate a little bit if, if there's chronic things that aren't resolved. Yeah. So whether they whether or not you've had a root canal, root canal. yeah, it's, it's a valuable piece of information. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, immunization. You know, this, this topic is so broad. Um, you know, basically, uh, the big disclosure I'll give here is, you know, my, my manifesto as a physician is to um, educate patients and, and give, provide information. So would, no matter what the end um, decision is by the parent or the individual, the uh, the job I have is to provide um, information. So I'm really big about empowering either parents or individuals about learning about you know the efficacy of immunization, also the potential you know consequences of some of the components of what is contained in immunization. So I like to share you know 
what's out there from a very unbiased perspective. Um, I would consider the obviously conventional medical community to be incredibly biased towards the efficacy of immunization without any of the, um, the limitations. And so um, I don't just refer people to the CDC website and say read the CDC website about you know immunization schedule. I have several um, book resources as well as electronic resources that I often share. Um, so that's something that you know I just think without I, I can't touch this too much without just leaving it there. I can speak a little bit to from the maybe holistic medical perspective some of the things that really jump out, which is adverse vaccine reactions. Um, in the documentation of those and the kind of science behind why that happens, which I think is kind of valid. Um, if you look at what are called the adjuvants placed in a vaccine, how they basically how a vaccine works is it's you're putting something with a killed virus or bacteria injected into someone's body, and you're putting a bunch of substances that causes the immune system to recognize it and rally to it. Unfortunately, a lot of those substances are things like heavy metals and formaldehyde and other basically toxins or even carcinogens to the body. And sometimes what will happen, and this is my experience, and this is just all I'm speaking to is my experience, is individuals particularly who have dysregulated immune systems don't respond appropriately to the adjuvants and killed viruses in those immunizations and end up manifesting usually an autoimmune disease process um, or a seizure related process. Um, those are adverse vaccine responses. Um, so that's something you need to weigh with every individual when you're making a choice about how to proceed with immunization. I, I'm a big fan of being educated about those potentials, as well as alternative vaccine schedules. For example, infants do not develop their own immune system until one year of age. The whole purpose of an immunization is to tell the body to immunologically create adaptive immunity to that specific microbe. If all of your immunity is coming from your mom in the first year of life, then how does it make sense to give you an immunization before one year old if the body can't actually create an immune response before 12 months of age? It's hard for me to kind of rationalize that choice. My suspicion and what I've you know, seen insider information around is that it's to indoctrinate parents about the importance of immunization. Um, we want to start immunizing. We got them in the office because we have well child checks, so let's get immunization happening so that that process is, is going when the child actually reaches an age where now they can adapt to the um, immunizations. So I talk with a lot of parents about you know, modulated schedules. Um, well, I also talk to a lot of people about homeopathic immunization, which is a method to create immune adaptation to microbes without the potential adverse effects of the adjuvants and um, killed toxins that are in the vaccine injections. And those are administered sublingually and we do provide those at our clinic for people. So that's kind of a, a different path that can be considered as well. So um, I think that's probably as best as I can touch that in a really succinct statement. Hopefully that helps give a little guidance. You know, with adults and the flu immunization, my big thing is, okay, well there are thousands of strains of flu and the immunization covers for about three strains. So, um, sure, it could protect you against some of the three most virulent ones, but also, why is it that someone who has one of those flu strains, you know, half the room gets sick and half the room doesn't? Well, it's because of the underlying terrain of that individual's immune system and susceptibility. So I'm way more focused on things like detoxification and healing the gut and the immune-gut relationship and um, improving immune functionality, I think that's way more protective against the flu than, you know, exposing yourself to a, a vaccine. That's, again, a personal slide of mine versus a, a universe.
universal statement. Someone who has uncontrolled diabetes, someone who is really immunocompromised, there may be some cases where that makes a lot of sense to do um, a flu immunization. I'm not saying that those situations don't exist. Um, we also do a homeopathic annual CDC strain um, immunization. So we take the exact same strains going into the CDC strain and we convert it into homeopathic medicine to um, reduce or remove all of the consequences of the adjuvants that are put in the vaccines. Are those what make you sick? I mean, sometimes you get... Yeah, a lot of people will have a yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people will have a flu-like illness, and basically the immune system responds too vigorously to it. It really gets tricked into thinking that there's a full-blown infection, and you manifest all the signs of as if you did have the flu. And it may be a little more attenuated than a full-blown flu, but not much for a lot of people. And that's one of the biggest adverse effects of that immunization, because that happens a lot. Based on what you said, wouldn't it make sense to do a juice fast detox prior to an immunization? Sure. If you were to be doing an immunization, if you were to do an injection, it would reduce the inflammatory burden in the immune system and make it much less, much less likely for the immune system to react and make mistakes in a negative way. Yeah. Isn't there some good research about what's actually in those? That's when you see that. Yeah, I mean, formaldehyde is a good example, right? Alb egg albumin, um, a lot of them still contain uh, aluminum. Yeah. So, yeah, there's some, you know, pretty, like, scary. yeah, dead, you know, cut and dry, you know, compounds. And when you consider that nowadays the full vaccine schedule is 80 to 100 immunizations, even if those are minute doses, 